off. Um, yep, I'm Simon, here. and go ahead and press uh, record and uh, press live. Thank you. Hey, Randall, who, who's the lady? Is she in Hawaii? Randall? I see a palm tree. There is a palm tree. Uh, is that Hawaii? Is that Hawaii? I'm here, in, I'm here in California, but that is an artificial palm tree. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we have, we have the palm trees in L.A. too, that's for sure. <laughs> yep, that's right. Hey, Dave, how you been? How you been, Dave? Good to see you. Simon. Hi, Dr. Carlisle. Greetings, greetings. How are you, Tori? I'm fine. Simon, go ahead and mute everybody. That's not speakers. Okay. It's 3 o'clock. Got you. Okay. Oh, 12 o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but it was too busy. Is, are we all ready? We're ready. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the weekly Black Health Trust Program. My name is Janelle Maxey, and I'm coming to you from California, Los Angeles, California. And I am your host for today. Um, today's discussion is moderated by the distinguished Dr. Randall Maxey, Chief Medical Officer of Advanced Community Medical Care Corporation here in Los Angeles, California. The mission of the Black Health Trust is to provide credible insights from our community health experts to best serve our communities of color with a coalition of leading and longstanding black medical professionals across a diverse spectrum of disciplines to offer unvarnished opinions and insight onto our physical and mental health during these challenging times. Um, I wanted to share a few housekeeping items for the meeting. First, please be advised that video conference is live and being recorded on different public platforms such as Facebook Live and that participation on this call is voluntary. If you choose to participate on this call and prefer not to have your image and likeness displayed, then you have the option to block your picture and mute your voice by changing the video and audio setting on your device. Um, be aware that when content is posted on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, that you are giving them permission to use your picture or any photos or content in whatever way they choose, including selling information without in permission and without any remuneration. This is in their terms and conditions. Uh, number two, everyone's audio must be muted until the host or facilitator asks you to contribute in order to minimize the distraction of the background noise. Um, make sure your device is on mute until called on to speak. And then once again, place your device back on mute when you're done speaking, please. Um, as for the chat room, please limit your questions to two questions per topic being addressed. And please do not use this form to advertise or pro promote your products. Um, understand that there may not be sufficient time to get to all of the questions during the the call, but we'll do our best. Um, please note that the information communicated on this call is not deemed to be medical or legal advice. And you should always consult your own medical or legal professional for advice pertaining to your particular situation and needs. Um, we want to give a big welcome to all of our distinguished physicians and special guests. We thank you in advance for sharing your time, information, and educated insights with us. We are blessed to have your participation and that you care about and support our community. Knowledge is power. Welcome again, everyone, to the Black Health Trust meeting. Thank you, Janelle. I appreciate your time and excellent hostessing. I'd like to welcome everybody to the Black Health Trust uh, uh, meeting, our Zoom call. This is also being streamed on Facebook Live and LinkedIn. And we know that we have people all over the United States, the Caribbean, and even as far as Cape Town, uh, South Africa and Ghana and in Nigeria and maybe some other places. I'd like to give special thanks uh, to our guest speakers 
including the distinguished president of Drew Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science, Dr. David Carlisle, who prior to being president of the university was, I believe, in charge of the Board of Regents of the uh, state of California. He can clear that up in a moment because I can't read my own biographies that I have. Uh, also, uh, an exciting uh, young man named Dr. Car Dr. Cameron Webb, who rumor has it just won the Democratic primary in uh, Virginia. Uh, and hopefully he will be elected to the US Congress. He is both a physician and an attorney. And we also have uh, for your listening pleasure, uh, the distinguished uh, Mr. George Wallace. Now, this is not the George Wallace of old. This is George Wallace of new, uh, who is a, a humorist and a comedian. And uh, going to our tradition of having uh, social comment given by uh, prominent entertainers on our talk. We also have a number of other physicians uh, waiting in the wings to speak on certain topics. Uh, I'm going to lead off with the first um, uh, talk and then we'll invite the others. And if I can get this right, I'm going to share my screen. Simon, can you make sure my Slides get up. Yeah, go ahead and share your screen already. Okay. Can I go back down to share my screen? Yes. I don't see it. On the bottom middle, next to chat, there you go. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I'm Dr. Randall Maxey. I'm a practicing internist in, uh, in Los Angeles in the Inglewood area. Uh, can you make that large for me, Simon? Um, you have to click on your, on your screen to go full screen. Not doing it. I wanted to start off with the uh, cases. Dr. Max, try try clicking, double clicking on one of the one of the slide, the first slide. No. No. Can you can you see it like this? Yes. Okay. Okay. The cases in the United States. These are updated as of August the first. The total cases are four million five hundred and forty-two. Uh, 1,579 with 68,605 new cases. The total deaths to date in the United States are 152,870. There are 371 new deaths. And this is compared to yesterday's data. The US government predicts that over 20,000 new deaths will occur during the next three months. We have noted that there are increased infections. We know they've come from bars and parties. They've come from family gatherings. They've come from beaches with crowds. I had a young lady uh, last week who came to my office with shortness of breath. She thought she was healthy before that. She had gone to a beach riding her bike. She had a mask on, but there were crowds of people there. She did not have a glasses on, did not have a face shield on and she was immediately admitted to the hospital and she is positive. Uh, we know that there has been indoor dining and there's over 47% of the new cases have come from people who've gone to indoor dining and also surprisingly outdoor dining where people dine on patios and places outside the restaurant, over 23% of those people have come back positive. So that is something we need to look at. Health equity is when everyone has the opportunity uh, to be as healthy as possible. But we know that there's long-standing systemic health and social ills that make many people in certain racial and ethnic groups more vulnerable in getting sick and dying from COVID-19. To stop the spread of COVID and to move towards equity, we must work together and ensure resources to maintain 
and manage physical, mental, and spiritual health. It's very important that we wear masks, that we share information as we do on this call, and we heed it. A lot of people still think that this is a hoax. I don't know where they get that word from. Important items. We know that nutraceuticals are important for, uh, for home. Uh, we tell everybody that uh, taking things such as micronutrients, prenatals are good, prenatal vitamins, vitamin C, uh, vitamin D3, minerals, calcium, iron, and selenium, antioxidants uh, are good, green leafy vegetables. We tell people they should stock up on uh, food, particularly packaged foods, dry foods, frozen foods, and uh, you should also know the location of, uh, of family members. That would be uh, very important. So personal uh, protective uh, equipment is very important. And we know that uh, if you're using the regular mask, the cloth mask, the face uh, cleaning things that you can wash them and you can wash them in soap and water. They can be placed in a washing machine uh, and that will do it. You wanna use the highest temperature that you can. Uh, then you put them in a dryer and use the highest drying temperature that you can. Uh, prior to putting them in, when you take them off, you wanna first wash your hands for 20 seconds, put on a pair of gloves, take off your face mask, put them in a laundry basket or bag, and then put them in the washing machine and subsequently the dryer. That is for the regular cloth mask not the disposable surgical masks, which are mostly paper. Uh, however, uh, if you are using the uh, N95 mask, uh, you cannot do that as easily. Uh, I'm concerned that uh, many people come around uh, me and they don't have on a mask. I believe that's willful disregard. I'm in the old age group and I could die. So I'm willing to say that that is attempted murder and you should do the same if somebody comes around you and you're older and you don't have on a mask. This is not a joking uh, matter and some people t tend to think that that's what it is. So we also believe that you should be ready for a quarantine. It's going to be longer than, than we might have thought. Now, many of us wear nine, N95 masks. Not only health professionals are doing it, but a lot of regular people are doing it. I urge you not to use alcohol spray. Uh, there are three recommended treatments uh, for cleaning and reusing these, even though we don't want to reuse them if you have enough supply. But if you don't, you can use uh, vaporous hydrogen peroxide. You can use ultraviolet light or uh, you can use moist heat and incubate it in an oven for over 60 minutes. And you want the temperature to be 60 to 70 degrees centigrade, 70, 80% humidity. And it's been shown uh, by certain articles that you can use that type of mask over 30 times after that. Or some people have said that if you put it in a dry paper bag for two to three days, I recommend five, that might be okay, but it has to be a breathable bag and the reference for that is the Canadian Medical Association uh, a Journal of a, uh, a few months ago. Important tips, uh, washing your hands with soap and water for 20 seconds is very important. Uh, the nutraceuticals we spoke about before are important. And they're also diagnostic things. At my office and at my house, when you come in, you have to wash your hands with uh, alcohol, 60% alcohol. There's a thermometer put in your ear to make sure that you don't have a temperature. We also recommend that people go and get lab tests, whether it be the nasal swab, the finger prick, uh, sputum tests, and they should be checked uh, for the active infection as much as possible. Supposedly, your insurance will pay for that. Some places are free. We know that our city of Inglewood gives a test, Los Angeles gives a test. There are safety tips on what you should do. We try to mention this every time. Wipe off cell phones, laptops, keyboards, and doorknobs. There should be no handshaking, no high fives. Uh, keep hands out of face and mouth and eyes. We know that there are three places we don't want your hands to get, your eyes, your nose, and your mouth. Those are doorways.
to the respiratory system. Wash your hands again for at least 20 seconds. That's saying happy birthday twice. Uh, safety and clinical, clinically discard mask. And there's a technique and we'll make sure there's some videos on the website to show you how to discard your mask, how to take it off and how to keep your hands clean during that. Travel should be limited. That's very important. We also know that social distancing, three feet between chairs, six feet between chairs, avoid crowds, don't go to a public gym, avoid eating out if you can, and wash off produce with uh, baking soda and uh, water with two teaspoons of baking soda and eight ounces of water, and that will serve as something to, uh, to clean, your, uh, clean your vegetables. Uh, I'm going to introduce the uh, first speaker, who is going to be Dr. Uh, Cameron Webb. Dr. Webb is a physician, a member of the National Medical Association, and uh, I don't think we're supposed to talk about politics, but he just did win the Democratic primary. And if he wins the election, which we fully expect he will do, uh, he will be the first male physician attorney in the US Congress. Uh, I'm very happy that he agreed to speak with us today. Dr. Cameron Webb, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Maxey. It's, uh, it's great to be with you all today. I know uh, I think your screen is still still showing, but but uh, in any case, just wanted to to start off by um, by saying hi, give you a little bit of context. So you know, again, I'm Cameron Webb. I'm an internal medicine doctor at the University of Virginia. I'm a hospitalist, um, but uh, I'm also the director of health policy and equity at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. So um, and so I think that you know that's that's important um, for a couple of reasons. It's because I spend a lot of my time in the policy space. I know. Uh, several of you who are on the call over the last, you know, 15 years or so, I've been been uh, working with and learning from you and and talking policy for a while now through through NMA. But but um, you know, for me, a lot of that uh, not only led me from medicine into law, but also led me to work in the White House uh, under President Obama in 2016 and as a White House fellow. And that continued um, into 2017, where I worked as a White House fellow also in the first few months of the Trump administration. So kind of have a unique, uh, unique dynamic, unique experience there. Um, but I wanna talk about COVID a little bit in the context of health policy, because this was a really interesting week uh, in the health policy front. So you know, Dr. Maxey ju just uh, mentioned that I'm not supposed to be talking uh, politics on here. I'm gonna do my best, but, uh, <laughs> but I think, um, you know, we're, we're in the midst of a pretty interesting moment because we're coming to the end of some of the key elements of the last tranche of funding um, you know, kind of across our, our uh, society to help us navigate this COVID pandemic, particularly its disproportionate outcome or impact on, on communities of color. And we know that early on, we were concerned about how this, uh, this virus was going to impact black and brown communities. You know, here in, in Virginia, where I live, you know, uh, the, the unfortunate reality is that, you know, African-Americans have a disproportionate share of cases, about 24% of the cases, while they're about 13% of the population and about 25% of the deaths. Uh, similarly, you know, outsized impact uh, on morbidity and mortality in the black community. We're seeing more hospitalizations. And so, you know, this, uh, this effect is, is significant. Now we can talk all day about how the social determinants of health play into that. But what I, what I wanted to focus in on for just a few minutes was to walk you through where things are, are standing on Capitol Hill, just to give you some, some perspective. Because you heard um, from Dr. Maxey kind of the, the state of, uh, of the virus, but I think the state of the response is also imperative for us to keep our minds wrapped around. So of course, House Democrats introduced kind of their bill um, aimed at that next tranche of funding to see how we can get more dollars flowing into our communities and impact particularly health professions. Um, and Senate Republicans actually just introduced theirs on Monday. So what I wanted to do is just um, focus in on the impact on healthcare providers, uh, the impact on healthcare more broadly so that we can uh, talk about just the differences between those two. Obviously, um, just for context, uh, in, the, um, in the US Congress, they're supposed to be going on a recess throughout the month of August, but nobody expects that, that uh, legislators are gonna leave for the month like they typically do. We think they're gonna have to come back and, and get this squared away because of the, the critical issues of unemployment insurance, the critical issues with states having the resources that they need. But on the healthcare front, one of the big numbers that I wanted to start with was both bills, both the Republican and Democrat bills, uh, were aiming to increase, uh, to some extent, funding for providers, uh, trying to address lost revenue. That's something that 
I know a lot of us have thought a lot about. Um, and if you look more broadly, about $175 billion have been invested, that's billion with a B, uh, invested in, um, in trying to help keep health providers whole uh, through this entire pandemic. And we know that even that has been far from enough. Um, the uh, Democrat plan that, that was introduced uh, a couple months back um, was suggesting adding an additional 100 billion uh, of funding to reimburse providers for lost revenue and expenses. The Republican bill introduced this week uh, looks like it would be about 25 billion additional dollars. So there's a significant difference there between the amount of dollars that are flowing into practices to try to help keep our, our practices and keep access to care afloat. So that's the first one I wanted to point out. Um, the second one is, uh, is COVID-19 treatment um, cost support. And that's something that we haven't talked a lot about um, in terms of how we are paying for COVID-19 treatment. Now, I work on the COVID unit at the University of Virginia. Disproportionately, my, pa my patients are black and brown, and disproportionately, they're going to be the ones getting that, that bill, whether it's through an extended acute care stay, or in some instances, they were in the ICU, now they're on the floor. So we know that these are going to be really significant healthcare bills. Um, you know, for some people, these are going to be really crippling healthcare bills. So the idea of treatment cost support um, is something that a lot of folks have talked about. They're actually no specific dollars in the Republican um, bill that was introduced this week for that. There are about $90 billion in the Democrat bill. So big difference there. Um, you know, we keep saying in this response, uh, there is there are a lot of challenges that we faced as a nation uh, since March trying to wrap our arms around this. That's the reason why we keep seeing uh, upticks in cases. And one of the most fundamental challenges is addressing the testing paradigm. You know, and some people have called for a national testing program Others have just said states need more resources or we need to shore up the, uh, the supply chain. But by whatever design, we need more dollars flowing in to help us with testing and, and contact tracing. So there have been about $34 billion already invested by Congress in, uh, that have already been passed toward COVID-19 testing. The Democrats and their plan um, aiming to increase that, add another $75 billion for more contact tracing, for more testing, to help us, again, get our arms around it. For Republicans, theirs is $16 billion. So again, $75 billion versus $16 billion. Um, the other number I want to point out is community agency funding or community health funding, health agency funding. Um, already, we've seen about $45 billion that have gone into that. Democrats are proposing an additional $19 billion, whereas Republicans are proposing an additional $32 billion. So they are looking to put more money into health agencies and community health. Uh, than the Democrats are proposing. And again, some of these things all kind of offset. Um, just some additional notes for you before I close. You know, of course, uh, Republicans, uh, they're adding about 26 billion more in kind of vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. So dollars flowing into those spaces, uh, some specifically through corporations. You know, uh, the, the federal government has already put a billion dollars into the Moderna vaccine that's entered phase, phase three trials. So there are a lot of dollars going toward trying to help um, kind of on the pharmaceutical front. And the Republican bill also proposes about $7 billion for personal protective equipment as well. The Democrat bill proposes about $98 billion for COBRA payments for laid off workers. So you see there are significant differences here. I want to zoom out for a second just to say that the Republican bill, as you can probably imagine, is less money. So it's a, a total of about $1.1 trillion uh, in the Republican plan. Uh, the Democratic plan is about $3.4 trillion. We don't know exactly where Congress is going to settle. We know that there are some sticking points, you know, far beyond the healthcare space. Um, you know, so Republicans are looking at $111 billion total toward healthcare. Democrats about almost $400 billion. So, but the more the more sticky issues are going to be the stimulus checks, the unemployment insurance, um, some tax breaks for businesses and things of the like. So, so stay tuned. Make sure you engage with legislators. Make sure you engage with individuals and as health providers, keep a close eye on how many dollars are coming in our direction, because I think that that's gonna be a critical one. We have some offices, particularly, I'm on the governor's task force here in Virginia for primary care and just talking about the number of practices that have been pushed to the brink of closing um, that still have so many furloughed employees. The amount of dollars coming in to help preserve access to care, particularly in underserved areas are critical. Uh, the way dollars have been flowing has largely been through Medicare, but we know that disproportionately the Medicaid populations look black and brown. And so we have to make sure that every state is tending to uh, the practices that, that share the, the lion's share of our minority patients. And so I just wanted to give you all just a quick rundown on, on the latest on, um, on kind of the politics. Um, you know, of course, there's still plenty of work to do. Cases are rising in states all over. And and I'm sure we'll, we'll get into, into the weeds on this a little bit more, but, um, but I'll stop there. And uh, Dr. Max, if there's anything else you want me to touch on, happy to do so. 
Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you and I'm honored by your presence. And uh, I started out years ago in law school, but I couldn't hack it. So I went to medical school. So you, you went through both of them. But you chose wisely. <laughs> as a physician and someone dealing with health, health equity, I'd like you to comment briefly on, you know, everybody says that blacks and browns have more comorbidities and therefore the COVID uh, makes us more vulnerable to the effects of that. What about the environment and the, the air quality and the other things uh, and the water quality that are in these communities? And is there any increased vulnerability there? And when you get to Washington, how will you address that? Yeah, you're only telling half the story if you say that the comorbidity, the, the excess comorbidity explains the differential in coronavirus uh, deaths or even hospitalizations. Because what you're not telling is the way that food insecurity feeds into excess rates of diabetes or cardiovascular disease. What you're not talking about is how housing instability or you know, exclusionary zoning, you know, the history of the legacy of redlining puts uh, folks in more congregate living settings that increase the likelihood of the spread of the virus. There are so many factors, even down to you know, the role, the impact of income inequality and the disproportionate number of black and brown individuals who are our essential workers who've been forced since the beginning of this pandemic to be the ones out and about and engaging. Um, and, and now as we're talking about schools reopening, uh, the families who are not, don't have the, uh, don't have the luxury of having their kids stay at home and get a tutor and have a nice little pod, but instead have to send their kids to spaces where they're engaging with other kids, that's an additional exposure. There are inequities literally at every step of the engagement here with COVID-19. And so I think that, you know, for me, my research here at the University of Virginia is focused on social determinants of health. So I'm always focused on housing, food access, environmental justice or environmental racism, um, you know, uh, transportation, education, and, and uh, income inequality, you, you name it. Those are the factors that I think come together that create this perfect storm. And I think in a lot of ways, COVID just highlights uh, the inequalities that already exist. And for those of us, and I know a lot of you who are on the call are in the same space. For those of us who've been in the health disparity space for a while, um, we've, been, we've been loud. We've been talking about the impact of these social determinants, the impact of health inequities in our communities uh, that are driving the disproportionate impact. I say it all the time, but health happens where you're born, grow, live, learn, eat, play, and pray. And so because of that, that's where the future innovation, uh, the future interventions need to happen. And so we both need to work on what's happening right now and make sure we're addressing um, the, the risk of COVID that's disproportionate in certain communities, but we have to walk and chew gum. At the same time, we have to make sure we're getting upstream of, uh, of likely infections, getting upstream of uh, future challenges and in investing in our communities uh, just the same. So you're actually, you're absolutely right. And I think in Congress, it's about taking a health and all policies approach and recognizing there's always a potential uh, for driving inequities in, in other policy spaces. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Janelle, are there any questions in the chat box? No questions. Okay, I'm gonna ask one more question. Uh, okay. I live in, I work in the city of Inglewood and I was telling my wife the other day that it is a food desert. There's not a healthy restaurant in the city. The grocery stores don't have the same types of foods we have in the more wealthy area. Uh, what, as a hospitalist, are you seeing the nutritional effects of the community of the patients who end up coming in for treatment and admission in your hospital? I, you know, I've been seeing this since I was in training. You know, honestly, what you're realizing is the second you try to propose that a patient get on the DASH diet or some other approach to mitigating that first step when they have high blood pressure or high cholesterol or diabetes is going to be some diet and exercise. And I did my residency training in New York City at, uh, at Cornell, but my, my clinic was in Queens. And in, in, uh, in Queens, just across from the Queens Bears houses, you know, every time I would tell folks diet and exercise, we knew there was only you know, one, one real uh, grocery store in the area that, that had its challenges with access to fresh fruits and vegetables. And we knew that, you know, from a safety standpoint, people didn't feel comfortable exercising. So instead I'm telling folks, well, walk one additional bus stop um, and, you know, climb the stair or take the elevator to one floor below your apartment and then climb the stairs that last step. You know, the workarounds that we're trying to do just to make this work, um, they're incredibly challenging. And so I think that, you know, we see that, uh, we see that up close and personal, not just in the ways that we're treating individuals, the ways that we're giving advice to mitigate the risk of progressing to 
to you know, um, you know, full diabetes or or having worsening of cardiovascular outcomes. But I think if you take a step back, our communities are designed in a way that makes people sick. So that's when you know, I, again, I bring up the idea of zoning. Um, and really quickly, I'll tell you the, the story of of Chicago, and I did my my law school in Chicago, and how that became the food desert that it is in so many ways, was that grocery stores make their margin off of those additional items, the the mops, the brooms, the paper towels, the things that people buy in terms of household goods. And in lower income communities, people buy less of those things. And so, uh, you know, a lot of times what we would see is that the grocery stores would say, hey, I can't make money in that community the way I can make it in a, in a wealthier community. And so there became a dearth of larger uh, grocers going into those spaces. And the way to, to work around that is to essentially subsidize the presence of grocery stores in lower income spaces. And when you had white flight from the cities, when you had wealthier um, minorities also leaving those communities, you were left with you know, individuals who couldn't necessarily always support grocery stores making that kind of margin that put it in their business interest to be there. And so, you know, the city of Chicago had to do a lot of work to, to entice. I think Walmart was the first one to come into, to, um, you know, one of the neighborhoods there uh, to, to try to create that change and, and create that access to, to healthy food. So yes, food deserts, huge issue. Um, I actually don't, don't use that word as often anymore because I call it food apartheid. I think it's, it's deliberately designed, right? Deserts are, are naturally occurring and apartheid is something that's man-made that we have to you know, continue to, to say, hey, we can, we can redress that, right? We don't change deserts from being deserts, but we can eliminate an apartheid. And I think that's important and also keeping uh, a close eye on the idea of food swamps, um, the, the reality that uh, fast food uh, density, liquor store density, is disproportionate. So that's all, a lot of what we have to do there is just looking at the redesign of our communities, the redesign of zoning, allowing people to move to neighborhoods to have more opportunity. And really, um, I think that's, it, it's reversing some of the, uh, the policies of the early 20th century, but um, they're still having a harrowing effect on our communities today. Yeah. Those grocery stores should know that uh, the people who work those mops and brooms are are from our community, so they ought to give us a benefit. I'm gonna ask you one last question before we move to the next speaker. Uh, as a practicing physician and as an about to be representative in the US con Congress, what would you say to those of us who are in your constituency, even though we're not in Virginia, what can we do in our daily lives to improve our health and uh, ability to withstand this health problem that we have? Well, broadly, in terms of the health challenges facing our communities, the biggest thing we have to do is we have to advocate for, for communities that are designed for health. And that's why, you know, I love the language that we're using these days, the language of health equity. Um, and and you know, Dr. Satcher, of course, is one of my one of my heroes in health leadership. But remember, when we were talking about healthy people 2000, we we're talking about healthy people 2010, now 2020. Um, all along, we've been saying, hey, health is in all of these policies. It's, it's across our society. So, um, and, and as we say in politics, um, all politics are local. So even though we could be doing a lot of things at the national level, um, really your advocacy uh, at, a, at a state and local level in city council meetings and conversations about zoning uh, and conversations about education and conversations about the, uh, the benefits for city or county employees. Those are critical conversations to help change our communities. That's a good starting point. In terms of the broader piece, I think that we still have a lot of work to do. Um, I'll say two things really quickly on that. We have a lot of work to do to make sure that there's trust uh, between our health professionals and our communities. And that, that is bi-directional. I think that we, we do have to make sure that in our communities, uh, we're saying, how can we connect people with the best health information they have. Sometimes that falls on a lot of minority providers, but we've got to make sure that people are here from trusted individuals. And then the other thing is we've got to be, uh, we, we must encourage our young people um, to, to you know, enjoy the sciences, to get involved, to get engaged, to shadow um, some physicians, because we need you. Now, the future is dependent on having more physicians of color. Right now we're at 5% of the physicians in the United States who are who are you know black physicians and so so I think that's that number is way too low. We have a lot of work that we need to do uh, to create that pipeline and and make that investment in our schools, make that investment in our youth because that's going to be a key ingredient to our having healthy communities in the future is having folks that people can trust. We're building on the legacy of um, we call it the, the Negro slave health deficit or the medical apartheid or or whatever you want to call it, but we're building on a legacy of mistrust that's earned, right? And Tuskegee was 1972. That's that's a real living history for people. Even today, there are still atrocities happening. So so we do have to make sure 
that as we move forward every single day, we're building that trust, creating that trust so that, uh, so that we can, uh, folks can, can have that confidence that whoever they're interacting with does have their best interest at heart. So there's a lot of work to do, but, um, but we have to do it together. Thank you. Uh, Janelle, any questions in the chat box? Um, someone says, is it true that the White House operates with the understanding that COVID-19 would affect democratic states and preferably minority communities from the outset of COVID-19? Hmm. I think that's an observation a lot of people have made. Um, you know, of course, I wasn't in the White House um, by the time that, that COVID hit. But I think that some of the president's rhetoric around, um, you know, funding for different states, uh, he's definitely politicized it to some extent. He'll talk about Democratic governors who've requested his help and how he helped them out and they should, you know, return the favor in some way. And, and, um, and I think that, you know, a lot of people were worried when we were advocating aggressively for CDC to release data on race and ethnicity of, of our you know, positive cases of COVID, uh, folks were saying, you know, we don't want uh, the... the political authorities to, to lose interest in this virus that they're seeing as disproportionately affecting communities of color. Like when we saw early on that Chicago, 70% of the deaths were, were African-American. Those are things, those are, are legitimate concerns. Um, but in terms of, you know, a smoking gun and seeing that that's how the White House is making their decisions, I don't know that we've got that. But, um, but we do have some correlations. We do see that the funding is flowing in, in, different, in different directions. Um, I know states like mine here in Virginia We've been reaching out aggressively uh, to this administration to ask for the support, to ask for help. We have a Democratic governor and a Democratic General Assembly. And uh, I can't say we've always gotten what we need, um, but, but I think that a lot of states are in a similar, similar situation. So I think um, you know, where, where there's smoke, sometimes there's fire. So I wouldn't be surprised if that's, um, whether subconsciously or you know, we talk about unconscious bias, whether that's playing in in some form or fashion, uh, much like the opioid epidemic, when, when it starts to affect other people, and um, that's when you see the interest. And this virus doesn't care your, your color of your skin. If it's in the community, once we get a, a significant amount of community spread, everybody's affected. I did get so I think that. that people Could you try that. again? Well, thank you very much. Um, mm -hmm. I want to introduce our next speaker, and I, I would like you to stay along as long as you can so we can have a discussion afterward. Uh, there are four or three historically Black medical schools, and the fourth was uh, built several years back, is named after uh, Dr. Charles Drew, who was a pioneering surgeon who invented the process of uh, blood typing and blood transfusion, who himself met an untimely death in Mississippi, I believe, uh, due to an automobile accident. Uh, we're very fortunate to have with us the president and chief executive officer of our fourth historically black medical school, Charles Drew, located in the city of Los Angeles. And uh, he is a distinguished uh, doctor, uh, Dr. David Carlisle. I've known Dr. Carlisle for quite a few years. He's a gentleman and a scholar, and I'd like him to have the floor and speak to us, Dr. Carlisle. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Maxey, and to, um, to all of our distinguished panelists and, and guests, um, I hope you are doing well and staying safe and, and practicing all those uh, public health measures that, um, that uh, you just heard uh, Dr. Maxey and, and Dr. Webb speak to. Um, a, a special shout out to, to Dr. Webb. Um, as a uh, expatriate Virginian living in California, I'm very proud of your uh, political trajectory. And um, I, I'll say that listening to, uh, to the broadcast today is my 93-year-old mother, uh, who's a native of Alexandria, Virginia as well. So uh, Virginians are in the house and uh, Dr. Webb, we're very proud of you. Just uh, keep on keeping on and best wishes in November. Let me, uh, let me share my slides. And as I'm doing so, let me uh, walk back uh, just one thing that uh, the distinguished uh, uh, Dr. Maxey said. Um, I, I have no relationship with the, uh, with the UC uh, Board of Regents. Um, I do have a couple of degrees from, from UCLA, but I, I will say um, I, I've worked with the Regents before, certainly. But one thing I, I do want to point out is that um, we have something exciting going on in the state of California right now. Uh, we have a new president of the University of California system, and that is Dr. Michael Drake. 
Um, he's kind of a favorite son here in California because for the past um, several years, um, after being chancellor at University of California, Irvine, he was the president of the entire Ohio State University system. And now he's come back to uh, the University of California to become not just president of our system, but our first physician to serve in that role, as well as the first African-American president of the University of California. So we're all very excited uh, with Dr. Drake, looking forward to working with him. And yes, I, I do represent the, um, the students, uh, faculty, staff, alumni, and trustees of Charles Arju University of Medicine and Science. Uh, we call ourselves a, a private university with a public, public mission uh, for reasons that will become, um, become evident to you. I'm gonna take a few minutes and, and talk about, I'm sorry? I'm gonna take a few minutes and, and talk about COVID-19 testing at, at Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science. We call ourselves a CDU. But just a, a, an important point, um, testing for COVID-19 is one of the important legs of um, the effort to combat COVID-19. Um, clearly, if you don't know whether you are COVID-19 uh, infected or not, um, you're kind of living in a, a limbo. If you get a test and you're told it's positive, uh, then you can certainly implement some significant public health measures. You can self-isolate. Uh, you can, can eliminate the possibility of passing COVID-19 to your friends, to your family, to your loved ones. Um, you can stay at home and watch for symptoms. Um, and if you know that you're getting worse, uh, you can contact the healthcare system and say, yes, I had a positive COVID-19 test. If you don't have the test, you don't know any of that. If you have the test and have a negative test, uh, then of course, uh, things can change and that's much more reassuring. Another point about testing, however, is that it's only a, a one-time cross-sectional snapshot of a result. One can be COVID-19 testing negative one week and positive the next week. So testing only does so much, but it is an important pillar in terms of fighting the fight against COVID-19. Everyone again who has a positive test can implement measures to keep themselves from passing COVID-19, uh, the novel coronavirus on to other people, especially people that they love and care about. So a few words about, about testing at CDU. Um, our testing center, uh, we, it's, it's a misnomer to call it the CDU Testing Center because it's really operated by the LA County Department of Health Services on our campus and was brought to us really by the vision and leadership of uh, second district supervisor, uh, Mark Ridley Thomas in collaboration also with the LA County Fire Department um, uh, led by um, Chief Daryl Osby, uh, another African-American. And of course, Mark Ridley Thomas is African-American as well. Um, and of course, all this happened under the uh, auspices of the uh, County Department of Health Services led by Dr. Christina Galley. <clears throat> um, the reason Supervisor Ridley Thomas said, we need COVID-19 testing in South Los Angeles, a, a black and brown community, um, heavily African-American, heavily Latino, is because there was no testing. Um, the CDU site is the first such site in, in, the, in South Los Angeles. There's another site at the Christ, uh, Crenshaw Christian Center. That's an LA city site, uh, but the site at CDU was the first LA county site. Um, Supervisor Ridley Thomas was looking at the early data about the pandemic in, in California and LA county. And just like the rest of the country, um, people thought that COVID-19 was a disease of the affluent. People thought that COVID-19 was a disease of world travelers. People thought COVID-19 was a disease of athletes, of actors, of the rich and famous. But it was only because those were the people who were getting tested. Those were the people who had access to COVID-19 PCR testing early on. Those are the people who could call up a physician at two o'clock in the morning a concierge physician and say, doctor, um, I think I'm afraid I might have COVID-19. Can I get a test? And that concierge physician would say, show up in my office at seven o'clock in the morning and I'll give you a test. Um, that's how COVID-19 testing first unfolded. 
missing from that scenario were the vast communities of color, under-resourced communities, underserved communities, um, communities experiencing medical apartheid um, that, were, that had no access to COVID-19 testing. Supervisor Ridley Thomas said, not only is this wrong, it is unjust. It is a major example of inequity. Now, of course, we know that great quote from Dr. Martin Luther King, of all forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. Well, the original rollout of COVID-19 testing was a direct demonstration of exactly what that quote meant. And Supervisor Ridley Thomas said, we've got to do something about this because what I hear from my constituents, Dr. Supervisor Ridley Thomas said, is that they're being hammered by COVID-19 and nobody knows about it. And that's why Supervisor Ridley Thomas um, brought COVID-19 testing to the CDU campus. Um, this is a, uh, what I'm gonna share with you is information from our report of our testing uh, site. And uh, this report was published about three weeks ago. It's available online at the uh, Charles Ardrey University uh, uh, website. And here's the cover from the report. Again, you see the, the quote from uh, Reverend, Reverend Martin Luther King. Uh, this is the, uh, the site manager, Dr. Sheila Young. And here you see uh, yours truly as well. And so the information I'm gonna to present to you today is directly from this report. Um, this is probably the most important slide I have for you because this talks about how we unrolled COVID-19 testing at the CDU site. Um, today, uh, this site is the busiest site in the LA County system. Unfortunately, today is also uh, the last day of operation of our COVID-19 test. Uh, we knew that we were not going to be uh, doing testing uh, throughout the entire summer because we had some major construction projects that were impinging upon the site on both sides. And those projects are moving along and we're moving the site to two different locations within LA County, more on that later. But since the time that we opened the site on April 8th, all the way through the end of July and into early August, our site has completed more than 60,000 COVID-19 PCR tests, averaging now over 1,000 tests per day. 1,000 people who did not know what their COVID-19 status was, who when they received the results knew they were either positive or negative. And this really, this, this testing had basically three important phases and um, important from a policy standpoint because there's a significant policy message here uh, that separates the CDU site from other sites throughout the county and, um, and throughout the city of Los Angeles. And these, these lessons are really transferable all around the country uh, where we have populations that are under-resourced with poor access to healthcare. Uh, we started out early in April as pretty much any, like any other site we were doing drive-through testing. People would come in, they'd make an appointment online, they'd show up in their car, the windows would be rolled up, um, they'd get a sample kit, they'd pass it back out. And we were doing around 200 tests per day. And then basically our leadership, especially our students said, you know, we can do better than this. We can get many more people tested if we go out into the community and say, you know, you can get a COVID-19 test right around the corner at Charles Ardrey University, and guess what? It's free. And once we started doing that at shopping centers, on street corners, just passing people on the sidewalk, all of a sudden, we started ramping up the numbers. We started doing 400, 500, 600 tests per day. And that was a, a, big, a big jump because our site was designed to handle only 450 tests per day. All of a sudden we had transcended that number. But then we said also, we can do better than this. We will start doing walk-up testing. Um, you don't have an appointment, you can walk up and we'll give you an appointment the same day. You don't have access to the internet to schedule your test, no problem. You can walk up and we'll get you tested. Um, the walk-up line eventually started moving faster than the drive-through line. And all of a sudden our numbers <laughs> skyrocketed we started doing 750, 800, 
and a thousand tests per day. So the message here, I think the policy message is, especially in under-resourced communities, one of those resources that many people don't have is access to a car. If you're relying on drive-through testing for COVID-19 um, and you have a community where you don't have a lot of people with access to a car, that's not going to cut it. You need to do something else like walk-up testing. Number two, um, access to the internet. If you're relying on people to go to the web and schedule an appointment and lots of people don't have access to the internet, that's not going to work in an under-resourced community. Um, you need to have the ability to do testing on the spot, on the fly, uh, walk-up appointments, same-day appointments. And then your numbers can go from four or 500 a day to 1,000 a day. A couple of other take-home messages um, that we did, because our students, our medical students, our public health students, our nursing students, we're doing needs assessment. And this is another important policy point for COVID-19 testing in under-resourced communities. Find out how people are doing. Um, a lot of people have said, let's transfer testing to um, primary care physicians. Well, guess what? Of over 30% of those who tested at our site did not have a primary care doctor. They don't have anywhere else to go for COVID-19 testing. They can't get it done anywhere else. If it wasn't for this testing site, they wouldn't be getting the testing done. 3% of those that everyone that we tested said that they had nowhere to stay that, that evening, nowhere to sleep, no, 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 no roof over their head that evening. And we were able to work with social services right on the spot to provide housing alternatives for those, uh, those individuals. 2% of the people who came through our testing site basically indicated that they had an immediate need for mental health support and we were able to provide it for them on the spot. So these findings suggest that similar needs assessments should be a standard component of COVID-19 testing, especially in under-resourced communities. Um, here's some details. Um, uh, we're looking at different age groups and I know this is compatible with uh, California national data. Um, there's kind of a, a mirror image trend going on. The greatest preponderance of deaths from COVID-19 are in the upper age groups while the greatest preponderance of infections and incidents is actually occurring in the younger age groups. The problem is those younger people, they're passing COVID-19 on to their parents, to their grandparents. Um, and that's why it is also important for them to get tested for COVID-19. An interesting thing about our site is that most of our patients, most of the clients who came through the site were Latinx, about three quarters of all the tests done in our site um, were in the, from the Latinx community. Um, our location, which uh, when our university was founded was 90% African-American, has now changed demographically and we're now about 70% Latino in South Los Angeles. But not only were Latinos um, the predominant group to get tested, they also had the highest test positivity rate of 13.6%. So in California, especially, but I'm sure in many other parts around of the country, um, when we talk about communities of color, uh, we also need to keep in mind the Latinx community um, because with all the issues that we've talked about uh, that afflict the African-American community, those issues certainly pertain to the Latino community as well. But there's another issue that affects the Latino community disproportionately. Uh, we asked um, uh, people getting tested what some of the fears you had were about getting tested. And one of the things members of the Latinx community definitely emphasized was they were afraid that they could lose their residency status by getting COVID-19 testing. They were afraid that they could get deported. They were afraid that family members um, might get deported. This was a definite fear in the Latinx community. And here you see the slide. Um, of, of all the tests that were done, about 78% uh, were performed on on uh, Hispanics and Latinx members. Uh, in, at our site, 11% were performed on African-Americans, 4.3% uh, on Asians. Um, Latinos had the highest uh, case uh, positivity rate of 92%, um, very significant positivity among the Latinx community. So that's the end of my presentation. Again, I want to emphasize the fact that testing is important. If you don't shine a light on a problem, you don't know it's there. 
Um, there's an old saying in medicine, if you don't take a temperature, you can't find a fever. You don't know COVID-19 is out there unless you're doing testing. And now because of the testing that was done at this site and other sites in, in, in the communities of color throughout Los Angeles, we know how significant the burden of COVID-19 is on these communities. So again, thank you very much. And I'll say, Dr. Maxey, I do appreciate it. And um, I'm available for questions. And again, a special shout out to my fellow Virginian, Dr. Cameron Webb, uh, best wishes for November. Thank you very much. I have a question. Yes, sir. Hi, Dr. Jordan. Yes. Of the patients that, one, what is the positivity rate? If you're testing a thousand people today, I, I think I heard it's 11% is testing positive. Yes, and, and, and it's a moving number. Um, what, what happened in, in California is that early on in the, um, in the pandemic, uh, March, April, um, we had testing positivity rates of over, of roughly 10%. Mm -hmm. Then when we entered into our, our period that eventually culminated in relaxation of social isolation standards, our test positivity rates in California and at our site as well had dropped um, down below 5%. But then I think our site, um, I, I saw the data from our site before I saw the data from the state of California, all of a sudden the positivity rates started creeping up again, um, 7%, 8%, 9%. 10%, 11%. Um, right now we're testing at about 10% positive at the CDU location, a little bit higher uh, than the LA County average and uh, higher than the state average. But it's that increase, which is now causing great concern among policymakers in the state of California and LA County. Are we doing any kind of follow-up? So if I were to come in and be tested and found to be positive, okay, I know I'm positive, I'm feeling okay, so I'm not taking anything, I'm going home. Can I come back in two weeks or three weeks to test to see if I'm negative? Uh, yes, we've, we've had a number of individuals at the CDU location receive um, second and third test for exactly mm -hmm. that reason. You know my position, one of my positions is positive. Uh, no, sir, I didn't. Uh, uh, we, yeah, we can he's talk home for the past two weeks. Well, he was in the hospital too. Okay, well, I'm glad he's home and doing better. He's doing better. Great, great to see you, Dr. Jordan, always. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jordan, you didn't introduce yourself. I want people to know exactly who you are. You mind? Of course not, I don't mind. Dr. Wilbur Jordan, director of the Oasis Clinic, uh, located on the campus of Martin Luther King Outpatient Center and Charles Duke University. We're testing all of our patients now who come in. Uh, we're doing both the blood tests and the swabs. Interesting, we're finding more <laughs> patients who have a positive IgG and they were not aware that they ever had it. So I think there may be something in some of the HIV meds that's offering protection also. But uh, right now we have probably for every, we only have two patients who have a positive swab. We have about 11 who have positive IgG and looking confused because they didn't know they had it. Um, thank you, Dr. Jordan. Uh, Dr. Carlel, uh, given that you have such a high percentage of Latinos in the community surrounding uh, CDU, is there any reluctance that you have encountered of illegal migrants to be tested for fear that they might be exported or lose their job or any hesitancy there? Uh, yes, absolutely, uh, there is. And um, uh, what we, we've heard anecdotally, we haven't collected this data uh, uh, systemically or systematically rather yet. Um, but I think that people are tending to come to the site at CDU um, preferentially if they're concerned about their, their immigration status because we've made it clear as we've been out um, in the community um, uh, recommending that, they, that people get tested that immigration status is not a barrier to testing. Uh, we're not going to look into it uh, in testing and it will not be reported from our data. And uh, so I think that uh, this actually um, increased 
uh, the numbers of people uh, who might be undocumented getting testing at the, uh, the CD site. Uh, obviously in California, this is a very important public health consideration because of the numbers of uh, undocumented Californians. Well, thank you. Um, we've had a number of physician guests over the past several weeks and typically a number of them are on the line. Are there any of our previous uh, physician uh, speakers who would care to address the two speakers today with a question or a comment? Can I make one more comment? Yes. Yeah, our patients, and, and this goes also to what Dr. Carl I just said, uh, in the HIV epidemic, <clears throat> we have a big problem with a lot of Latinos being afraid because of their immigration status. And one of the reasons we have an evening clinic was basically to treat them because many were insecure and did not want to come in. If they saw a car that even looked anything like a, a black sedan or something, they wouldn't come, but they thought it was immigration waiting. And that's a fear we don't understand. So we started our evening clinics for one, our closeted male, and for two, that group of patients. So for this epidemic, I've asked our patients, are you homeless? We have more black patients who are homeless than Latino patients. But when you ask the Latino patients, do you have a place to stay? The answer is yes. Uh, you sleep in a bed most time, yes. How many sleeping in a room? Six, seven, eight? I ever went to one, I, said, I need to see this. 11 people are sleeping in a room. But when you have 11 people sleeping in a room, most of them on the floor, if someone is sick, everyone's gonna get sick. And you know, in this county, 75% of the patients who are in the ICU from COVID are Latino. So I mean, environmental issues, cultural issues, are important that we have to address still. And one we need to address in terms of black folks is stop eating so much fried chicken and pork chops and waking up in the morning with a blood sugar of 340. <coughs> well, thank you. I see Dr. Vladimir Betos is on. Dr. <laughs> Vladimir. Who is Hi, how are you doing? This is Dr. Beato. Can you hear me well? Yes, introduce yourself quickly. Yes, this is Dr. Vladimir Berto from Mehari Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee. And once again, thank you for this great program. And thank you, Dr. Kailai, for your great presentation. One question I have for you, Dr. Kailai, um, some guidance. Here in Nashville, Mehari is doing most of the testing, community testing for, for the city. But one observation we made is at the African-Americans are not coming forward to get tested. They are very reluctant to get tested. While in the Latinx communi community, we don't see that. They usually come with their fam families all together to get tested. But there is still a lot of skepticism in the African-American community regarding the test. Even in my clinic, people say they won't get tested. Even if they are symptomatic, they refuse to get tested. Are there any recommendations or strategies you can advise uh, uh, to solve this very important issue? Well, yes, um, and thank you very much for that, that question. You know, this, this is a, a significant issue and we know that um, there is a testing reluctance in, among um, African-American individuals uh, across the country. And um, I, I can't speak specifically for Nashville, although I've been there several times on the Meharry and Fisk uh, campuses, et cetera, et cetera. But um, uh, this is an issue, and I think it goes back to, to things that, that, that Dr. Webb mentioned, um, fundamental issues with trust in the healthcare system. Uh, this is part of this, this perfect storm um, that communities of color, especially the African-American community, are, 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 are dealing with and facing. And probably the most important um, way that we can address this is by changing the face of the healthcare system. Uh, it was very meaningful for our students to go out into the community and say, hi, I am so-and-so. I'm a medical student. I'm a nursing student. I'm a public health student. And yes, I'm African-American. And I urge you um, to get a COVID-19 test. I can assure you that we're not going to 
sequester your DNA away and do all sorts of other analyses, I can assure you that the results are gonna stay private and confidential. And I can assure you that the testing is being done with your best interest in mind. Now, anyone can say that, but I think hearing another African-American say that um, and look you in the eyes and say it with sincerity is, is, is transformational. So, so I know I, 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 I salute Meharry for its role in community testing. This is exactly the type of role that our uh, institutions uh, need to be playing. Um, and our community, I think, is, is receptive and, and responsive to that kind of communication because you can't get that um, from other institutions uh, that are on the other side of the medical apartheid barrier, um, especially historically. And, and people are afraid of this. And it, it, it goes back to Tuskegee, the Tuskegee experiment. It goes back to you know, slavery. Um, it goes back to institutional racism. And um, the fact not only that, that African-Americans have distrust in organized institutions of power within American society, but that distrust is earned and is a experiential distrust. And that's why it's so important, not just to change the face of institutions, but to, to change the entire being embodiment of institutions that are serving communities of color. Thank you. Um, Janelle? Thank you, you Dr. Dallas. You're welcome. I have a question. Um, is there any anti antibody testing in addition to PCR testing? And how is the contact tracing being managed? A question for me, uh, Janelle? Yes. Yes, we, yeah. we, we're, not, we're not doing antibody uh, testing right now um, at, the, at the testing site. We're not doing it at the university. Um, but I, we just heard uh, Dr. Jordan say that, uh, that he's doing it um, uh, um, among his patients at the Oasis Clinic on our campus. And, and Dr. Jordan, your, your, your findings are, are compelling. They're, they're fascinating. Uh, we'll, we'll have to talk some more and, and, and figure out how, what, what to do with this and what it means. But, uh, but those results are, are compelling about um, uh, the I, IgM results um, and, and very interesting. Uh, but no, we're not, we're not doing antibody testing right now. Uh, we're just doing uh, strictly uh, COVID-19 PCR testing. Just for the audience who is mostly lay people, uh, can one of our guests uh, describe what PCR testing is and what the IgG IgM testing is for? They're two different types of tests for different reasons. Can somebody clear that up for us? I can. I mean, PCR means polymerase chain reaction and you are detecting the viral particle. We do PCR testing and HIV all the time. And the goal there is to be able to say you're undetectable. That means when I take your blood, we're looking to see if there are any viral particles in your blood. When we take the nasal swab or the throat or swab, we're looking to see if there are any particles of corona in your system. When we do a blood test, looking for IgG, we're looking to see if your body has made antibodies to it. There are two types of antibodies, IgM, which when you have an infection, whether it's measles, chicken pox, et cetera, you're going to have an IgM that is positive. Six years later, I can do a blood test on you and I can determine that you had chicken pox because you would have a positive IgG. So what I was saying earlier, we have patients who have an IgG positive, which means they have had corona, we're not aware of it. Uh, and when we do the PCR, which means we're trying to detect if there's any virus in their system, it's not there now. They only have the blood test, the antibody test to it. I hope I can get confused folks. Hey, Dr. Jordan, would, would you agree though that uh, what you described explains why there's some concern and confusion by interpreting uh, the antibody test. Uh, it's Dr. Fagan. Uh, how, how are you? Yeah, I see you. How you doing? <laughs> no, but I think you need to understand the two because <laughs> we had to stop when right. we start telling people because people were freaking out. Right. And it's, again, I should be able to tell you and you not freak out, but right. I'm talking to a lot of people who may not have finished high school. I'm talking to right. undocumented. Right. I'm talking to people who are staying with 10 people in a room. Right. So you've got to really be careful. Just, right. And it's a hard concept. 
right. to get you for the first time in your life to understand <laughs> you had something, you were not aware of it, you have right. antibodies to it, but you don't have the swab that you should, you know, I mean, they, they don't right. understand that. It takes a right. while to do that. Now we're trying to, with those patients, right. get them to give blood so we can see if we can make sort of a gamma globulin for, for other people with that. But right. you know, we're talking sort of a scientific language to right. a, a lot of people who are nervous. Some are not, but many are. Now well, my well, physician, well, he wants to give blood as soon as he can right. to do it. But for patients, they don't understand that. So it takes, you just can't sit and, and walk out the room. You gotta then sit there and have a good 15 minute conversation to try to see if they understand it. They understand about 30%, they go home and tell everybody the wrong thing. So we'll, and then they come back and you have to yeah, explain we'll, it to everybody again. Well, but the Garth Graham, uh, CBS uh, chief medical officer on, on the panel this morning of the NMA uh, conference mentioned uh, they're doing some uh, rapid tests now uh, where they can get the result back in a matter of minutes. Are you familiar with that one? Is, how yeah. is that available in California now? No, I'm not aware of it. The closest right. we have it today. Right. But let me just say that by let private me, hospitals. Let me just say that Howard University also has uh, been doing some community testing. <clears throat> and, what, and also in Maryland, uh, Dr. Cooch reported that we're seeing a younger age group now coming in to be tested, 18 to 39, uh, in the past couple of weeks. Have you seen that in your studies as well, Dr. Carlisle? Oh, yeah. That the age is now uh, younger being tested? Yes, actually, um, a, a, a preponderance of total tests are being done among the younger adult population. I say younger adult population since I'm no longer there. Uh, people um, <laughs> below the age of uh, 40 to 45, especially those in the age group around um, 35 years of age are, are making up the, the bulk of people uh, getting the, the testing at our site. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to see that there are other questions answered. We have some in the chat box, but I want to change the pace just a moment. I met a gentleman uh, this week, even though I've known about him for a number of years. He happens to be a member of West Angeles Church, uh, which is a very, one of the largest churches in uh, Los Angeles, uh, pastored by Bishop uh, Blake. Uh, and um, this person happens to be a humorist. He's a comedian, and my view is that among the brightest among us, us is a comedian who always has to think on his feet and have comments on what's going on in the current life of our society. So I'm very pleased and honored uh, that Mr. George Wallace has joined us today, and I'd like to invite him uh, to make comments and to speak on the subject at hand of COVID-19 and protecting our people from that. Mr. Wallace. Uh, uh, Dr. Massey, uh, good to be with everybody today. And first of all, you're gonna have to call me Dr. Wallace also, okay? I'm the most important doctor on this show. Let's <coughs> make it clear, okay? All right, Dr. Wallace. <laughs> I, see, I see all my patients at one time, okay? And I see them on time and they all walk out happy because I am doctor of comedy and uh, we know that uh, laughter is healing for the soul. You spoke of the church, uh, Bishop Blake uh, in the Bible, it says laughter is healing for the soul. And I hope you guys, you're honoring your essence and I'm learning so much from you guys today about medicine and COVID. And I hope you can somewhat still try to uh, uh, involve laughter in your work because even when you get off, and all you're going through, and Dr. Carlisle and Dr. Fagan and Dr. Uh, 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 Webb, you still got to keep some laughter in your life. And that's what I, and the, and the best thing about laughter, I say every night on stage, I have to say it, it it's the great, it's free medicine. That's number one. And so it's being at free medicine, we encourage people to overdose on laughter, keep it in the reach of children. And when you start laughing for more than four hours, then you call your doctor. So this is what I'm saying about laughter. You guys are giving the greatest information. I've learned everything from everybody this morning and it's just been awesome. Uh, but uh, keep some laughter in your life no matter what you do. I call it honoring your essence. You know, when I go to work, I look forward to going to work every night when I do work. I'm not working now because of the virus, of course. I'm quarantined, I'm down here in Atlanta. I'm quarantined, I'm really, I'm locked up. I'm, I'm practicing uh, social distancing. My daughter drove by the other day to visit me 
And I live on the 25th floor, so I waved at her and told her, keep moving, social distancing, that's close as you're gonna get. But you can't, I'm doing that, I'm trying, uh, I'm uh, social distancing, I'm trying to stay six feet away from me. I don't trust me, okay, I don't even trust myself. I'm washing my hands, they're pretty much the same color on both sides, so I'm, my job is to try to keep us um, somewhat uh, happy and keep some laughter in your life because when you stop laughing, you stop living. It's so important to keep laughter into everything you do. So I, even with your patients, uh, they can't see your face now because everybody's wearing a mask, but, but we, we can greet them with a, a great hearty good morning or good afternoon and try to make sure they're smiling when they leave, no matter what. You got to come, when you stop laughing, you stop living. And I could go on and on and on, but I want you guys to know how much I appreciate what you're doing. I've learned everything this morning so much. I learned about um, Dr. 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 Webb, uh, he running, being a doctor and a lawyer, and you know, a guy that can help you and lie to you at the same time. Isn't that wonderful? I'm just, <laughs> no, but I'm so, I'm so <laughs> proud. <laughs> I'm so proud that he's running for office. I'm a comedian, but right now I'm into this um, uh, voting for African-Americans to vote. We've got to vote no matter what young people. That's another thing we got to encourage all our patients. Do you vote? We got these new young people coming in there, make sure they vote. And, uh, and, and because it's so important, so much we can get done just with another one of us, African-American uh, senator or congressman um, in office. It could help us so, so much. Just think if DC becomes a state, changes the world for us, changes the world for us. So um, Dr. Webb, we can congratulate you on what you're doing, uh, the young man there. And uh, there's just so much to talk about, so much good stuff you guys are doing. And, and, I, and I, I just love what, what you guys are doing. Thank you so much for educating me on what's going on. And, and I can take it back to the communities and you doctors are doing great things about your uh, uh, community and Dr. Jordan. And who said stop eating fried chicken? What, doc, what doctor said that? Cause I did. Uh, that's Dr. Jordan. I didn't say stop eating it. I said stop too. eating so much. That's doctor. Can I eat it once a month? Can I eat it once a month? You can eat it every day, but don't eat 17 pieces. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I saw you in the Atlanta airport once, so I can say with my own eyes, you were eating too much chicken. Now listen, this, <laughs> Dr. Jordan, no, I only eat it, uh, for some reason, I only eat it when I come to Georgia. I, I eat when I, I'm in Georgia. It's a grocery store. That's here. dangerous. The only place worse than Georgia is Mississippi. <laughs> but he was eating fried chicken at <laughs> least with this one I saw. <laughs> listen, see, see, so see, you guys are laughing now, so you're crazy. That's good. Keep laughing. And my good friend, Dr. Fack, I've known him for 20 some years. I met him at B. Smith and he wasn't doing so well at the time. I had to pay for his dinner. Uh, but I see he's doing much better now as he's <laughs> working a great day. You guys are so good. I just want to thank you so much and uh, just everybody. I saw George. I saw George eating that chicken on Tom Joyner Cruise. Oh my goodness, that's who I'm talking to. <laughs> this is Tori, live around the corner from Rodney. Oh, listen to you. See, now people are telling on me they know about me and the chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Massey, Dr. Massey, the, the Dr. coolest guy. I'm so, um, what do you call it? I'm quarantined now. I, I can eat. I can't eat anything. I just eat what I got. So I'm eating chicken and Cheerios. <laughs> chicken and Cheerios. That's what I'm eating now. Chicken and Cheerios. <laughs> so, Dr. Wallace, <laughs> I have a question for you, Dr. Wallace. I know yeah. that you're trained in psychiatry. Do you have any observations on 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and the occupant thereof? You're talking about the main virus we have here is C40, <laughs> C45. This is the main virus. We're not supposed to be getting into politics, but the main virus, if we can do something with it, that's another, we go back to voting, we go back to voting. And when we can get everybody to vote, it's simple people, your vote counts. We can do this. I had a friend of mine, Ross West running for office down in Dallas, Texas. There's over 1 million plus black registered voters in the state of Texas, but only 47% of them voted. Another 3% of black African blacks had voted. We could win the seat, you know. I'm getting confused now because you know, I don't know whether you guys heard about it or not. We're having a little problem with African American now and going back to black. I don't know whether you guys heard about this, but this a new thing is coming up in the next few months. We're gonna go back to black, you know, and uh, it's, it's, it's a cyclical thing. And, you know, it started with Negro and colored and and the N word and then and, and the Afro-American and African-American and now we're going back to black and I'm pretty soon somebody gonna say, well, we wanna be called the N word again, but it's just, it's cyclical. So, but we can do this. Let's get this voting in and we get our health rights and everybody deserves health. I'm for all of this. I'm just, uh, 
I'm very proud of you, doctors, today. Learning and uh, and and uh, being. Uh, I'm just I'm just excited to be here. I want to thank you for having me, Doctor Massey. Well, thank you so and much. And I'm coming to all of your offices. And when I come to your city, I'm coming to Doctor Matt. And when I come to L.A. at West Angeles, I come to church. When I leave church, I'm going to go to your office. Or Doctor Jordan, where are you located? I'm coming to see you, Doctor. Hmm. Doctor Fag, you in D.C. I know where you are, and and the congressman. Well, we don't know where he's going to be here, young man. We don't know whether he's going to be at the office or whether he's going to be in D.C., but I need to meet all of you personally. And my new friend that has seen me on the time, uh, what's Tori, what's her name? I don't have her on my screen. Tori Bailey. Miss Borton, Dr. Bailey, it's so good to see all of you. And uh, I don't know what else. To, all, I, all I know is you need to laugh it off. No matter what you do, wind up laughing. Keep smiling no matter what you guys do because uh, <laughs> it's very important. And you know, I wrote a book. They said don't promote anything, but I just want to say, laugh it off, okay? Laugh it off. At the end of the day, just keep laughing. When you stop laughing, you stop living. And 45, the man in, in the White House, oh my goodness, uh, this guy, I call him a walking orange circus peanut. Uh, so I have, my language changes. I know I'm a member of Church of God in Christ, but sometimes 45 make you want to cuss. <laughs> and I know you doctors want to cuss sometimes too, but uh, Speaking of 45, he's just not, he's not, he's not right for us. He's not right for anybody, you know. Uh, we got to get him out, get him out. And, um, and we got a, 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 a vice president there in, in office and the black lady, if it's going to be a black lady, I don't care who it is, Tory, Dr. Bailey, I don't care if it's you, I'm voting for you. You understand me? I don't care who it is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm voting for the black lady, Susan. Rice, I don't care who it is. I'm voting. Right. And we're going to change America. And I, That's right. And I think Thank it's going to be Michelle Thank Obama. Thank you so much. Very much. Um, well, somebody's going to pay me. Y'all going to pay me for my time. I've been here sitting in this waiting room for a long time. Y'all just like at the doctor's office. <laughs> Y'all going <laughs> to, Dr. Bailey, stop laughing. I'm serious. I need some money up in here. See? All right. Very you going to go out and buy some more chicken. <laughs> Jordan, I'm gonna kill you when I see you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm gonna get some El Pollo Loco right down the street from you, Doctor. You know El Pollo Loco is that? Is that okay? That's not fried. El Pollo Loco. That we, that's fine, but don't eat 15 pieces. That we chicken, more, El Pollo Loco is so good. Kevin, another chicken will eat that chicken. Mm -hmm. We have some more uh, questions in our chat box, but first, uh, Janelle, uh, you have a statement to read. Yes, I am a proud member of the Black Health Trust family whose mission is to provide credible information and insight from our community health experts. We are so grateful to the numerous health professionals that have donated their time to the dynamic Sunday programs since the beginning of the pandemic. Our goal is to inform and help people of color become and stay healthy. Black Health Trust is developing the structure for a well-managed nonprofit organization and our continued success depends on your con contributions. Please consider a modest donation as every dollar counts. Visit our website, blackhealthtrust.org to donate via credit card with PayPal as well as Cash App. Black with a, the, the uh, tag is a dollar sign, Black Health Trust. Please see the chat box for a link to our website for donations and other valuable information. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Mr. George Wallace and uh, his Dr. friend. Dr. George Mr. Wallace. Dr. George Wallace and his friend, Dr. John Stukas, who made the introduction and has been responsible for the various celebrity guests that we've had for the past several weeks. So my hat's off to Dr. John Sadukas of uh, Florida. Uh, let's go back to the, uh, the chat box and questions, Janelle. Okay, one question was, um, how is the issue of the false positives being addressed in your efforts? I'm not sure if this was, I'm not sure who exactly this one was for, but. Uh, anybody can take that, uh, Dr. Carlisle, Dr. Jordan, Dr. Webb. I can take that and the one about using the malaria drug. Yeah. Uh, we don't use the malaria drugs for treatment. Uh, they're being used a lot, and I do mean a lot, in Imperial County. Uh, we probably have a thousand patients on it. And I've advised the doctor there, who is a friend of mine, to devise 
the patients into four groups because plus he used we used dexamethasone, which is a steroid. Uh, he's using hydroxychloroquine, which is a malaria drug, then azithromycin or doxycycline, and plus zinc. I have no idea what zinc is for. But I have to tell him to put one fourth in the the, the hydroxychloroquine, the whole group, start two other groups, one group with azithromycin and doxy only, one group with azithro and one group with doxy. I personally think that azithro is the drug that may be causing some treatment. That's what I put my position on when you got sick. Uh, the dexamethasone, if you can understand it, it's a steroid. It makes your body push all of your lymphocytes into your bloodstream. What doxycycline does and what azithromycin does is they basically are what we call bacteriostatic. They don't kill bacteria. They don't kill a virus. They hold it and allow your white cells to kill it. So I think, and it's me thinking, nobody else, there may be some rationale in treating that. I would not recommend anyone using hydroxychloroquine. The second question, if someone tests positive but have no symptoms, many don't. But we always, again, retest those persons. The persons who test positive and have had no symptoms, and when you said test positive, are you talking about the, whether it's the nasal swab or the blood test? If it's the nasal swab, they still have to be quarantined and come back uh, until they test negative. If it's the blood test, they're positive, we're testing them in six months just to see how long they stay positive. You are supposed to stay positive for a long time. Some of the early reports said that the IgG did not last that long. So we're testing our patients just to see. You know, we and people forget HIV, the first 10 years there were no treatments. And a lot of crooks made lots of money doing weird things because people were desperate. Again. It initially was hitting your wealthy, middle-class gay white boys in West Hollywood in the village. And people saw their friends dying hideous deaths. They were paying money for some weird things. I still have some Venus fly trap extract that supposedly would kill the virus. It cost $45,000 a bottle. Uh, so people were buying all kinds of things then. They would do it here. I tell that is a real good vaccine that we can trust or better treatments. You don't have people claiming to have treatments do things and people are going to spend their money doing it. That's always been the case. In uh, fact, for other diseases good, too. This is a good time for me to ask my question to everybody on the panel, including Dr. Bertos. Uh, last week or so, there was this video that went viral with this group of doctors standing on the steps of the Supreme Court. And there was this uh, lady doctor uh, who was espousing uh, all sorts of things, especially hydrochloroquine as guaranteed treatments uh, for uh, COVID-19. And I'd like uh, each person on the panel and including Dr. Uh, Jordan and Dr. Bertos Dr. Carlisle and Dr. Webb, and it, I'd like to hear some comments on that. And the reason so, because so many people believe everything that they see on TV, whether it's true or not. Just the fact that it got on TV, people tend to think it's right. So I would appreciate uh, you guys, gentlemen, uh, talking on this. Dr. Vladimir Bertos first. Okay. Yeah. Let me take on this. First of all, we have very, very limited in terms of treatment. Let us let me start with hydroxychloroquine, which has been promoted by President Trump in the news media. Hydroxychloroquine does not work. There are five published randomized control trials uh, about hydroxychloroquine. None of them show any benefit. Even WHO, had stopped hydrochloroquine in trials. The NIH, the CDC, the Infectious Disease Society of America, none of them recommend the use of, of hydroxychloroquine. 
Second, one drug that has been in many clinical trials that has been approved for treatment is remdesivir. It, it has to be given intravenously in the hospital setting and it's reserved, reserved for patients who are very sick. And there is also some disparities, racial ethnic disparities in terms of the distribution of this drug, and they say, who gets it, who, who controls the drug? So that, they are, that those are issues to address as well. And the third drug is dexamethasone, which is usually reserved for, for patients who are on oxygen, patients who are very sick. And, it seems to work even better than the remdesivir, remdesivir. And there are no drugs for prevention, meaning if, if someone tests positive, can I take a pill to prevent me from getting the disease? No, there is no treatment for, for this type of, 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 of scenarios. And, and, and lastly, in terms of preventive treatment vaccine, we're not there yet. Thank you. Is Dr. Richard Williams on? I want him to speak on the cardiac effects of hydrochlorocalcin. Dr. Jordan, Dr. Carlisle, Dr. Webb. Yeah, this is Dr. Jordan. I think I did hold everything uh, Vladimir just said. Uh, he asked me for my phone number and I came work this thing. So it's 323 791. 4271. Uh, but something that was earlier, too many black people, and in California, there is no excuse, do not have a physician. They go to the emergency room, to urgent care, for treatment. And for something like COVID, that is not the place. We need, again, to be doing things to encourage people to get a physician. So they have someone to go to to take care. Otherwise, you wait until you're so sick and you come in. And if you had called earlier, and not just for COVID, but other things too. I mean, as he said, a third of the people don't have insurance. And I mean, don't have a provider. In California, that makes no sense. You should be particularly among Blacks. So most of the Blacks here are U.S. citizens. So you should be able to have something. That's another project we need to be doing, getting our people enrolled in some healthcare plan. Uh, Dr. Carlisle, uh, being our resident uh, medical school, uh, would you work with the Charles Drew Medical Society maybe to create a go-to list for our community members? We have uh, several hundred members of the Charles Drew Medical Society and uh, it could be that they could work with, uh, with you there to get many of these patients to the doctors that make up that group. Uh, I think that would be good. Would that be something of interest to you, sir? Oh, absolutely. And um, I, I, I have to credit uh, the Charles Drew Medical Society for the uh, very existence of our university because they were one of the entities that back in the uh, 50s and early 60s was advocating for the creation of a uh, medical school and health profession school in South Los Angeles. Um, fast forward to today, we're here. Um, it was their, their, their shout out uh, that, that, that energized um, the, the motion for our creation. And I just wanna say, I just wanna echo the words of uh, Dr. Bertos and, and, and Dr. Jordan as well. Uh, based on um, all the evidence that we have seen, there is no role for hydroxychloroquine in the treatment of COVID-19. In fact, uh, we know that um, uh, alone or in combination with azithromycin, it can possibly uh, and, uh, be dangerous. It has definite uh, cardiac effects. And that's why the, the, the clinical trials that were looking into this uh, often were, were halted early um, because the, the results were, were not only looking um, uh, negative, but they were also showing uh, dangerous outcomes from the, this drug uh, combination as well. So no role for hydroxychloroquine. Uh, Dr. Webb, is Dr. Webb still on? I am. Um, as a lawyer who has a medical background, uh, is there an implied threat when people deliberately give misinformation to the public 
And we know that there's a lot of misinformation going to barbershops, beauty shops, and in communities and writing, tell them they don't need to wear masks. They don't need to create improvements in their immune system. Uh, and do you think any of this is purposeful or is it just willful neglect? What is your view as an attorney about to be congressman? You're our defender. Well, I, I think, you know, Dr. Stella Emanuel's comments, um, they fall in that category of, of um, very problematic at the very least, right? As, as a physician who's licensed by the Texas Board of Medicine, I think uh, it's, it's, it's concerning because there are going to be patients who hear that, who see that as a validation from the medical community um, for hydroxychloroquine and zinc and azithromycin when we have so many well-designed studies that have told us otherwise. I, I think what I always tell people is that you know, the reality in America is that you have to be a thoughtful consumer. Um, and so, you know, yes, you're going to hear information coming uh, from a lot of different directions, but you do have to be a thoughtful consumer. The reality is the weight of the evidence, as you've heard, all, everybody else already kind of allude to, is so, uh, it's so overwhelming. Um, in fact, the FDA even removed the emergency youth use authorization for chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine months ago. And so we, we've had more than enough evidence, more than enough data, and more than enough well-designed studies to tell us um, that, that medication, that hydroxychloroquine in particular, um, is not a medicine that's a cure at all for, for COVID-19. Um, I think, you know, really what's problematic, and I think it's part of why Twitter keeps uh, labeling uh, President Trump's tweets as misinformation. What's problematic is when somebody with a bully pulpit of his size takes and lists misinformation. Um, now, this is an admittedly anti-science administration. Uh, you know, they, they frequently disregard, um, you know, scientific facts or, or objective information in favor of, of kind of furthering their own perspective, their own views. He's a dog with a bone when it comes to hydroxychloroquine. He said just the other week, I'll be proved right eventually, right? He's, he's dead set on that. And we in the medical community, we need to continue to lean in and provide good information. I think that's part of what our role looks like. We have to be the purveyors of thoughtful, evidence-based information to our communities, to our barbershops, to our beauty salons, um, really, really across our society. And yes, there will be physicians like Dr. Emanuel um, who, who speak up and they're coming from a different perspective, but it's our job to be that resounding, overwhelming voice uh, that's got evidence at our back um, to, to do the good work. Now, is it legally actionable? Uh, not likely, uh, you know, to take legal action based on that, that information unless she was giving specific guidance in, in patient care. I think a lot of us use our, um, use our disclaimers pretty effectively, uh, but I think that in her instance, that wasn't a treatment regimen that she was uh, explicitly advising to a particular patient, but, um, but just the same, it's, it's bad for business. Well, thank you. Uh, this week, the National Medical Association, which represents more than 30,000 Black physicians in the United States is having its 125th annual convention uh, virtually. It was supposed to be in Atlanta, uh, but they have a website, which is NMA net.org. And the reason I'm giving that, uh, there is a section on there for consumers and patients. And they're having a series of talks and lectures and demonstrations all week long. And I believe part of it is open to the public, if I'm not mistaken. The speaker this afternoon, the keynote speaker, Dr. Fauci, uh, to the NMA, and I'm going to be sure to get that. Uh, most of the physician, all of the physician members that we have brought forth in this effort to bring credible information to our community have been members of the National Medical Association, many of whom are past officers and presidents, chairman of the board, and world-renowned uh, figures in public health, infectious disease, and other things. So I've appreciated uh, them coming uh, and giving of their time. And we're going to continue this uh, effort. Are there any other questions, uh, Janelle? Uh, no, someone just, uh, they posted a uh, study from the Henry Ford Health System that was claiming success in hydroxychloroquine. And have them please read Dr. Keith Norris's response. That's, his response is accurate. As a retrospective study, this provides a rationale for conducting randomized control trials to determine if it really works or is just an association. 
the randomized control trials have been negative to date? Every randomized control trial has been negative to date. Is Dr. Norris on? Uh, yes, I am. Hello, Keith. Welcome. Hello, everybody. So you want me to give my usual uh, introduction of you as being noted as one no. of the top 15 professors in the United <laughs> States? <laughs> no. Dr. Keith Norris, who is a new uh, uh, vice president of equity at uh, UCLA. Dr. Norris. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you. No, it's uh, Executive Vice Chair of Medicine for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. But, that's, but, I, but I always appreciate how you blow all of us up. So that's cool. <laughs> I've been known to do that it's part of the, the job. <laughs> but, but, as, uh, but as Dr. Jordan said, you know, all of the randomized control trials, which is the highest level of evidence we have, have been negative. Uh, negative for efficacy, at either negative or increased risk of adverse events. Right, so um, so that's where we stand right now. Uh, there are still some other studies that that may mo many studies have been terminated because of the results of the studies to date. And um, and and so uh, these association studies and observational studies they give us information that suggests it's worth looking into in more detail. But you have to you have to actually look at. Uh, you have to look at these in a controlled manner to really determine whether or not they truly work, because other, otherwise it could just be randomly um, distributed or it could be people have a bias as to who they put on a particular medication. And so that's why we do that, that type of approach. Uh, Dr. Norris, at the beginning of the, the call today, I read uh, a definition of health equity. And a couple of weeks ago, you gave a very astute talk on the effects of racism uh, on our society, especially in relates to COVID. And I'm wondering if uh, in a succinct matter, you could highlight the issues that uh, you brought up that make our people often more vulnerable, uh, not just because of comorbid conditions, but right. because of the effects of structural racism. Yeah, so I guess there's probably three different pathways. So we, as you said, you can have uh, increased comorbid conditions, which frequently are also based on structural racism. So the fact that um, if you have lower levels of education, uh, employment, uh, housing opportunities, et cetera, in certain communities, food, food opportunities, then that puts you in a position where you're more likely to develop certain conditions that then put you at risk at a time when a virus like this comes about. The second is uh, discrimination and or stress have, both, have been associated with increased rates of um, inflammation, uh, even starting as high as in, in adolescence, as well as reduced rates of antiviral activity. And those would also increase one's risk and susceptibility to a viral infection. And then the, the, the more common associated um, factors that we see associated with COVID is uh, exposure to the virus. So because of structural racism, people of color are more likely to be working uh, non-healthcare frontline jobs and, and many ancillary healthcare jobs where they're exposed to racism. They're working in meat, uh, they're working in, um, uh, delivery, they're working, um, you know, driving, driving buses, working in meat pack, packing plants, et cetera, et cetera. And then given the massive wealth disparities in the country are more likely to be in multifamily homes, multi-generational family homes and homes where there are multiple people living per room in order to be, uh, in order to be able to afford it. And that, that further increases one's risk to exposure to the virus. So that was, those are probably three different pathways I can think of offhand where structural racism leads to increased risk for people of color, particularly African-Americans. We see uh, Latinx community, Native Americans all having uh, substantially higher rates, particularly of hospitalization and death. Uh, to the entire panel, uh, I have an old slide and it purports to show that for every $123,000 of wealth that 
Caucasians have, Blacks have 33 cents, Latinos have 66 cents. And I'm cognizant that as of August the 1st, uh, the rules changed and that the federal anti-eviction law is gone. In many cities, the anti-renter eviction loss is gone. And I believe this is going in there. It's also data that shows that after uh, things like the pandemic and other natural disasters, that the wealth goes to the top 1% and uh, there'll be a lot of people losing property. From a social legal medical standpoint uh, to Dr. Webb first and then others, uh, what does this mean uh, when our economy is collapsing and pay is being stopped, loans are being stopped, workman's comp is being stopped, people can't pay rent or mortgages. What do we it do means, about? Well, I mean, the first thing is that it means that we have a, an unprecedented threat uh, to the health of black communities in a lot of ways. If you think about all the, the mechanisms by which a lot of these health disparities are created and just the, the sheer volume of forces that are exerting such an impact on those mechanisms. So, I mean, we, we have uh, tremendous levels of food insecurity, unprecedented levels of food insecurity in our communities in so many places. You have cars lined up for miles trying to get to food banks and that's going to be exacerbated. The only thing that's keeping it afloat right now is this unemployment insurance uh, benefit for a lot of folks. We still have 40 million plus Americans who have new jobless claims. So, so in so many ways, uh, you know, we, we're, we're facing a really tremendous crisis. Um, the eviction piece, you know, the, you know, it's been said for, for years now, housing is health. And, and the idea of folks losing their housing, um, that's going to be, uh, you know, a critical problem. I don't, I don't, I suspect that, that that's something that Congress will get worked out. I think that the, the, um, the downside risk is too high um, to, to not do so. I do believe that, that they'll also pass another stimulus. So there will be money going into the pockets of American families, but whether it's going to be the $1,200 or the $200, you know, we'll, we'll see, uh, or sorry, 600 versus 200 for unemployment benefits um, in terms of stimulus. We'll see exactly what those levels uh, fall to. I mean, it's, you know, this is, this is a really scary time for a lot of families. And I think that the, the further thing you got to keep in mind is that we still have the fall coming with the, the likely prospect of an increase in the number of COVID cases in all of our communities, the likelihood that we're gonna have to pull back from as reopened as we currently are, and that that's gonna have an, another impact on, on our businesses locally. We may have you know, a lot of communities shut down again. So you know, we're, in a, we're in a really tough spot. So I think that the advocacy piece is, is critical. We have to be uh, a megaphone on behalf of our communities, um, especially if we're gonna be keeping uh, in mind um, really the, the future health impact of these changes. Last thing I'll say is that uh, the educational impact right now, uh, K-12 schools uh, where kids are going virtually versus uh, you know some kind of mixed model. Remember that in communities like the one where I live, we have huge issues with the digital divide and the lack, lack of broadband access for a lot of youth. We're creating educational disparities that will reverberate through time. And so it's so important for us to keep our eyes on that. These are, these are the, again, this is the medium in which tomorrow's inequalities are being shaped. And so we've gotta be really on the ball. We're seeing it happen in real time. We have to be really strong advocates in the midst of all of it. Dr. Webb, we're not allowed to talk politics, but because you're a health advocate, how can people on this call, and sometimes more than 7,000, reach your office or you because they're interested in health? How can yeah. they reach you? How can they help find out more about your plans for health advocacy? Because we can't deal with politics, right? That's right. That's right. Well, the best way to reach me, a um, couple of different ways. On social media, I'm on Twitter. It's at Dr. Cameron Webb. That's D-R-C-A-M-E-R-O-N, Webb, W-E-B-B. -B, and I'll drop that in the chat. Um, my website, similarly, is drcameronweb.com. So I have a lot of information there. But um, my email's easy. It's Cameron at drcameronweb.com. Those are the three easiest ways to get in touch with me. Uh, I love kicking around ideas with, uh, with folks, you know, really just uh, always keeping an eye out for the best approaches that we have to stem the tide to address some of these critical issues. But uh, but like I said, it's not lost on me that we're in unprecedented times, so we're going to need unprecedented advocacy. And, uh, and I'm glad that, you know, the up to 7,000 of us on this call are equal to the task. So looking forward to doing it with you. Well, thank you. And unabashedly, and they can kill me if they want, 
in order to get people elected to Congress to advocate for your health, you know what you need to do. Thank you very much, Dr. Webb. Uh, the other comments on the economic effects of what's going on with stopping pay and stopping uh, anti evictions and any other comments from Dr. Norris, Dr. Carlisle, and others on the call? Well, if I may, one thing that I can add is, um, and I, I totally agree with, with everything that um, uh, Dr. Webb said so, so eloquently, that's uh, totally, totally on spot. Um, one, one additional consideration uh, from COVID-19 is loss of the little access to healthcare that people might have. Um, if you lose your job um, because of COVID-19, your employer may close, may go bankrupt. Um, unfortunately, you lose your access to health insurance, uh, usually. You lose your access to health insurance, you lose your access to your provider. Um, uh, bills start coming in. Uh, this is another part of the perfect storm that we're facing as a result of COVID-19. Um, this issue is obviously going to disproportionately affect the African-American community as well. And we need to keep our eyes on this uh, going forward as well. People are going to be displaced out of the healthcare system uh, because of COVID-19 and the results are not going to be good. Thank you. Uh, is Dr. Helen Davis on the line? This is Keith. Keith, go ahead. Yeah. I would say we should have David say that one more time because I think people don't really grasp the impact of that, right? We've had the Affordable Care Act but I think it would be good to have David say that one more time. That, that's really crucial when we think about health care and access to care. Dr. Carlisle? Oh, well, uh, thank you for that, uh, Keith, and great seeing you, and congratulations. Um, yes, the, the reality of the American healthcare system, unlike that of any other industrialized nation in the world, is that your access to health care is tied directly to your job. You lose your job. You lose that access to health care. Um, you lose your job, you lose your personal health care provider. Uh, this is a problem. And COVID-19, as challenging as it is already in this country because of this relationship between employer and employment and health, COVID-19 is going to make it much worse because many of these companies are laying people off. Many of these companies are closing. And many members of the African-American community are going to be losing their access to health care as a result. Interesting, interesting. There's a thought that I'd like to just put out. We won't belabor it now, but there is one American business that has not ever and will not ever go out of business in terms of having an insurable interest in our people. And that is the faith-based community, the churches. Wouldn't it be interesting if they could find a way to lock arms, and California law does allow an insurable interest in a population that you could have insurance that wasn't based upon your job, but on other factors. And that could be something that could be explored and obviously I've done a little bit of it. Thank you so much. Any other comments from any of our previous speakers and doctors on the phone? Janelle? Thank you. No, nope, no other related questions. Okay. Are there any questions uh, anybody wants to have before we go? I'm going to give each speaker a moment to have a last go around. Dr. Maxey, this is Lamont Gibson, a pharmacist on the call. I would really appreciate uh, <clears throat> some comments on the cardiovascular dangers of hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. Okay. Uh, would my favorite nephrologist uh, like to comment on that, Dr. Norris? Um, particularly in combination with azithromycin, it's primarily arrhythmias that people are more prone to get. And because COVID is, uh, particularly people who get really sick with COVID uh, and have symptoms tend to have more than just pulmonary, but they tend to have more multi-system involvement, including cardiac involvement. That's the reason why there appears to be an, an increased risk of um, cardiac abnormalities, particularly these arrhythmias and potentially um, sudden death. And so some of the earlier randomized control trials in Brazil 
with high doses of hydroxychloroquine had dramatically high rates of death in uh, individuals getting high dose hydroxychloroquine. We don't see it as much now with high dose hydroxychloroquine, but in a randomized controlled trials, there are, while the deaths have usually been about equal, there still is an increased number of arrhythmias in the subset of people receiving hydroxychloroquine. And the concern is that even if there's, there's no adverse, uh, there's no difference in outcomes per se, <coughs> randomized controlled trial, you, there's a concern that people, a subset of people who have underlying cardiac disease or, on, or, on, or uh, are on cardiac related medications could be at even greater risk for having uh, untoward cardiac events. Could you also address in our earlier calls, calls uh, we had some discussion about uh, hydroxychloroquine uh, being dangerous for those people who had glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. And we know that this is a common drug used uh, for malaria, especially in Africa. Uh, can you comment on that danger and, and do people need to be tested for that deficiency first if they were going to use it? And we do use it uh, as, a, as a drug called Plaquenil. And Dr. Gib Gibson, you can comment on that too uh, for treating things like lupus and uh, psoriasis. Uh, would you comment on that issue? Uh, I'll have to pass on that one. I'm not as familiar with the, um, the risk of hydroxychloroquine, particularly as it may relate to COVID for individual with G6PD deficiency, although clearly that's, uh, the prevalence of that is much greater in people of African descent. And so, um, you know, that, that I, I understand the potential risk, but I, I, I'm not really familiar with yeah, Dr. Peters had brought that up. I don't know if he's on the phone. If he is, I'd invite him to step forward. Dr. Richard Williams, former president of the NMA. Uh, Janelle, I understand there's a question in the chat box. Yes, someone says, so if you are diagnosed positive with COVID-19 with no symptoms, are you supposed to quarantine yourself for 14 days? And if you don't get worse, you are assume you are over it? And then Dr. Keith Norris said, pretty much for many people, it can take five to seven days to get test results back. There is now a push to just do that since tests are not ready available. And then she, she also says, um, so personal treatment is this, is the supplements to build your immune system? Okay, so any of our infectious disease doctors want to comment on that? Dr. Jordan, Dr. Berto? Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not sure what is meant by personal treatment. You can't build your immune system up overnight. We, we deal with where you are that moment. But if you're doing a test, I assume she's talking about, or the person is talking about the swab. If you have a nasal swab or an oral swab and it's positive, you isolate yourself. If you're at an oasis, you're going to get another test in 14 days. You're not coming back until you are negative. If you had a blood test and you were positive, but your swab was negative, that just means you had it, you didn't know it, and now you have antibodies to it. The big question there is how long will your antibodies last and are you protected from a future exposure? We don't know those things yet. Dr. Bertos? I have to pass on this one. I'm eating it right now. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, we're almost at the end of the hour. I'd like to give each of our speakers and the other ones who were on the line, line with us to uh, have a last uh, quick word. I'll start with uh, Dr. Webb. Sure. I just wanted uh, to uh, thank everybody for for allowing me to join today. Thank you, Dr. Maxey, for having me. I think this is just such an important conversation, not just to have one time, but to sustain. So this is a wonderful forum, kind of week after week to stay uh, in this space. And, uh, and I'm grateful to be uh, surrounded by so many just phenomenal experts. Uh, Dr. Wilbur Jordan, it's good to see you again. And, and, uh, and just for so many folks who have been mentors and 
and um, and just uh, guiding lights to me over the years. So it's it's great to be around you. Um, but I think the the last thing I'll say is just um, really stay focused on on where you get your information to everybody who's out there. All information is not created equal. We're in the midst of a global health pandemic, but we're also in the midst of an infodemic. So just know that there's a lot of information that you can't trust. Make sure that you you uh, touch base with with some uh, trusted colleagues, sometimes some trusted health professionals, ask them where they get their information and make sure you're getting information from good spaces. And, uh, and with that, everybody stay safe and stay healthy. And there was a, an old time consultant in politics in Chicago named Mayor Daly. If he were alive, I would send him to you. He says, vote early and vote often. <laughs> Got it. Send him to Virginia to, to help you have your good luck. Uh, Dr. Carlisle. Thank you. And um, uh, as, uh, as Dr. Webb said, um, uh, thank you very much to the Black Health Trust for, for putting on this forum. Uh, these sessions are, are wonderful. Congratulations on, on the outreach. And I'll just say, um, in terms of speaking to some of the controversies, there is a difference between information and knowledge. Um, it's knowledge that is power, not information. You can have good information and bad information, but you wanna make sure that you're knowledgeable about the information that you have. And what we we're talking about, about with hydroxychloroquine is exactly that. Um, knowledge is hydroxychloroquine is not only ineffective, but it can be dangerous. So with that comment on behalf of everyone at Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science, our trustees, our students, our alums, our faculty, Thank you very much. And everyone, stay safe and stay well. Thank you. And as an ex-faculty uh, member there and ex-trustee there, I share in that. Uh, Dr. Wilbur Jordan. Well, thank you again. I've enjoyed doing this. And I'm going back to the program with the schools. I've talked to other folks and everyone seems to be in agreement. So I'll talk to you later about that, that I, I think there's something we can do with the schools and churches that can help our kids really learn better than what they're being given. Dr. Keith Norris. I, I, I agree with what everybody said, just, um, and, and particularly as David said, it's, it's really knowledge and we want to make sure information we have is credible and, and be thinking, and particularly as healthcare professionals, we need to be thinking about our oath um, to do no harm. And so when we think about information, even in, in when we have um, a, a situation where maybe we, we don't feel we have all the information, we should be making recommendations based on not doing any harm to patients, right? And so I think, I think, I think most people feel comfortable that we have a whole lot of information about COVID we have a whole lot of information about face masks. You've seen stuff about Sweden. Sweden's not using face masks. They talk about how great it is. They have some of, the, some of the highest rates of deaths per million people in the world, right? So any people who have, still have questions about those, if you think as a, as a healthcare provider, as a physician, first do no harm, we should be making recommendations to our patients that would not do them harm. And, and I think that becomes really important. Well, thank you. Um, we're going to close our program. I'm going to ask uh, Janelle. Oh, I see Dr. Davis. Hello. I was calling you early. Um, you gave us some very good information on the eye as a portal of injury. We're at the end of our program, but in a, a minute or so, can you just summarize that how dangerous the eye can be, especially as a pathway to the lung, Dr. Davis? and why we should wear face shields? Well, the eye is not as important as the nose and the mouth as the pathway to the lungs. However, it is a potential route of COVID infection because of the um, receptors in the tear film and then the lacrimal secretions. And so there have been shown that COVID can be in your tear film, it can linger on your, on your tear surface and it can be spread to the lungs. Not as frequently as the other routes, but because the eye is subjective to droplets and aerosols, it is a great potential source of transmission of COVID. And being that the uh, virus is so highly transmissible and it mutates, we have to at least be aware that this is a potential source 
of, uh, of infection. And so uh, I would strongly encourage healthcare workers who work close to the eyes, face, nose, and mouth to wear not only a mask, but also to wear goggles or a face shield. Um, you don't have to be in a you know, total hazmat suit and things like that, but um, because the aerosols can uh, be transmitted uh, for actually more than six feet and linger in the air for hours, uh, and we are working in an environment where we're seeing multiple people uh, at, at one time. So we are at higher risk for transmitting the disease as a professional and we could be asymptomatic. Uh, so I'm just cautioning uh, those who work in that environment where you are at, at potential risk to protect yourself, protect other patients, and also just to be aware of the potential of super, um, super vector forces like in children uh, as the vector uh, of transmitting this disease, being that many of them are asymptomatic. And as someone mentioned earlier, they're the ones bringing it to their family and to their grandparents and, and people with more um, mortality, more, more morbidity and comorbidities. And but lastly, once, lastly, while we're getting ready for affirmation, uh, just introduce who you are, Dr. Helen. Uh, I'm an ophthalmologist, um, East Coast trans referred to uh, California. Um, uh, I'm currently out in Bakersfield. I'm the uh, Chief of Ophthalmology at Kern Medical Center. And I'm basically seeing a lot of the same people that you're seeing at Drew, um, a lot of Hispanics, um, a lot of family members, the, the whole family's infected. And a lot of people are afraid to get tested because they're afraid to get deported. They're undocumented. They're working in the field. So they're coming in not only with COVID, but they have San Joaquin Valley fever and a high rate of AIDS too. So infections are there. Uh, there's a lot of really sick people. In fact, I was saying, I worked in the ghetto for 25 years in Pittsburgh and New York area. And I haven't seen as much disease as I've seen in Bakersfield. So there are a lot of people who have not had access to care. They're getting access to care. The county is pretty good about reaching out. And so we're reaching a lot of people. Um, and even though I'm not a primary COVID doctor, I'm seeing it indirectly. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Janelle, uh, would you read the documents you have? Is Janelle there? Yeah. Just Um, we do have one last question. Um, maybe someone can answer for someone. She says, my daughter is an educator and returning to school this week. She is being asked to be in, involved in a pep rally in the gym, six feet distancing. How should she proceed as she has already told the principal that she is uncomfortable with this request? Does anybody have any insight? Dr. Jordan? Anybody want to answer that before we close? I would say she shouldn't go. I don't think she you shouldn't should. go. Don't go. <laughs> you, well, you know, I'll, I'll say that this is actually something that um, uh, uh, CDU and all um, educational environments, especially uh, institutions of higher education, are, are working on right now. And we've just received our guidance from the LA County uh, Department of Public Health in this matter. Um, indoor spaces are concentrators for COVID-19. Um, the bigger the space, the better. The fewer the people in the space, the better. But when you have a space with a lot of people, even when there's social distancing, uh, that can be a potential incubator. And I can't comment on this particular circumstance, but I can say that the guidance is pretty much, you want to avoid gatherings of more than 30 students in any indoor space, according to our LA County guidance. And uh, that's for higher education. I can't speak to elementary, secondary, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, anytime you're putting people together indoors, the more you have, the greater the likelihood of transmission of COVID-19. Thank you very much. Okay. Janelle, you have uh, the statements you want yes. to make? Um, I just wanted to say that I'm a proud member of the Black Health Trust. 
family whose mission is to provide credible information and insight from our community health experts. We are so grateful to the numerous health professionals that have donated their time to the Dynamic Sunday programs since the beginning of the pandemic. Our goal is to inform and help people of color become and stay healthy. Black Health Trust is developing the structure for a well-managed nonprofit organization and our continued success depends on your contributions. Please consider a modest donation as every dollar counts. Visit our website, blackhealthtrust.org to donate via credit card with PayPal as well as with Cash App. The tag for that is dollar sign Black Health Trust. Please see the chat box for a link to our website for donations and other valuable information. Thank you. Well, again, I want to thank all of you for attending. I want to give special thanks to our speakers and physician guests uh, for today who've given us their time and intellect uh, to give credible information and knowledge, Dr. Carlisle. Uh, to our population so that we can better protect ourselves. I would like to urge everybody here to protect themselves. Don't get cabin fever. We still need to stay in. We still need to be away from restaurants. Even if they're outside, the evidence does show that there's still increased transmission. Even if you're eating on the patio of a restaurant or outside a restaurant, there is an increased transmission. Uh, they're telling me that for indoor restaurants, the transmission is over 43%. And for outdoor restaurants, it's still as high as 23%. So there is danger there. This is real. Please take care of yourself. Will Tori or Janelle or Judy read the affirmation in closing? Do any one of you ladies have that an affirmation? Oh my goodness, we had it, didn't know it was uh, the one by Cornell West. Let me see if I can pull it up since we're on here. I thought Judy was doing it today, sorry. Okay. In the meantime, thanks to everyone. While I'm looking at this, here we go. Okay. Dr. Maxine, keep it, keep talking until I say, okay. I have one, uh, Tori, this is Judy. Um, oh, you got it with you? I got it yes, too. Okay, our affirmation up. for today is don't be afraid, be focused, be determined, and be empowered by Michelle Obama. Oh, okay. Here's the Cornell West. You can't lead the people if you don't love the people. You can't save the people if we don't serve the people. That's our affirmations for the day. You got two for the price of one. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Judy. Thanks, Tori. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>